And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to time it so that when the people at the altitude below you push down to go in for the break, you can now descend down to the next altitude. And if you have yourselves oriented correctly around the clock face, like you described, it all should work really, really well. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I am your host, Vincent Aiello. And if you are just joining us, well, you are entering a conversation midstream, and you definitely want to go back and check out episode 13, where U.S. Navy Commander Jack Curtis, call sign Farva, begins this conversation that we continue today on day carrier landings. And in fact, if you haven't listened to episodes 11 and 12, you may even want to start there so you can get a background on aircraft carriers in general. Anyway, we pick up the conversation here today with Farva. We're going to wrap up day carrier landings. So let's get right back to the interview. It all should work really, really well. And without any communications, hopefully. So you leave your altitude at about the nine o'clock in my scenario. And so the guy at five, he's got to go to four and then down to three. And then, and of course, the air wing has already planned who will be at all these altitudes, right? So it's not just first come, first serve. That's so correct. Certain squadrons. And I think it used to be, uh, not to slam on my F-14 friends, but we used to see them always at two because they needed the most work or time or something when they landed. I'm probably going to get some grief for that. Well, it was always a balance because they, <laughs> they would they would argue that they needed the, the most turnaround time to give their maintainers a chance to okay. make the next launch. But then you always have the Hornet guys who said, well, we have the least gas. Uh-huh. Uh, so there was a bit of a balancing act. That's true because the guys up at four and 5,000 are airborne longer than everybody else. Okay, so it's a trade-off, and there's obviously some art and science in this. And then if it all works well, they all take interval off each other. So it requires some situational awareness and looking outside and using sensors and radars in some cases. And you set yourself up so that we've got a flight, no more than a four airplanes coming in at a time. And they'll break with about, what, 17 seconds of interval. Because in the daytime, ideally, is it still 45 seconds or roughly a minute or between the two? Yeah, a really proficient air wing that's flying really well and has been doing this for a while, you can target about 45 seconds. So one aircraft will land. If you imagine hitting a stopwatch, you could theoretically have another airplane. That first one gets out of the way. The gear gets reset. Everybody's done their jobs, and they're ready for the next one to touch down 45 seconds later. And like you said, that requires some proficiency because if the pilots are a little green and forget to put their hook up or can't turn or whatever, there's all kinds of things that can slow them down. All right, so let's go back to your scenario. We've got a a section, let's say, uh, you and me that just came in. You broke. 17 seconds later, I'm going to break. We came in at 800 feet. And there is, I don't know how much detail really people want to hear, but, you know, if, if we goon this up, we can't just go back up to 2,000. We can jump into what's called the spin pattern and set ourselves up to come in again. And, you know, that's, again, you, you end up just coming around and you set yourself up to do it again. But usually when you do that, someone else breaks in front of you and you get stuck in that little holding pattern. But if you do it right, you come in at 800. Once you're on downwind, then you level down to 600. You put your gear down, your flaps down, your hook's already been down. And now we get to what we call the 180. So we are heading opposite direction of the ship. We are right around the stern of the ship. And we're going to make a procedure turn so that we arrive right around the wake of the ship ready to land. Now, before we do that, let's go back to what you used to do. I'd never had a chance to do this, but there are people, like you said before, landing signal officers who are already there, ready to go, watching this whole thing. And they can, oh, by the way, get on the radio and say, hey, you're cutting your interval out, or they can otherwise give us motherhood because it's all about safety. But those are people that are pilots, right? But for right now, or maybe for today, are helping out the landing evolution. So talk to us a little bit about landing signal officers, who they are, where they come from, and what their responsibilities are for this scenario with the day landings. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll answer that by kind of giving you a little bit of a, an idea of uh, how I got to do it, the path that I followed, uh, and then we'll tie that back into this recovery. So the primary mission for landing signal officers is safe and expeditious recovery of fixed-wing aircraft aboard an aircraft carrier. It's no accident that the word safe is put before expeditious, because again, we'd like to use our airplanes again. And so what you have is you have a a cadre of pilots from within the air wing, fixed wing pilots, who have demonstrated either uh, through, sometimes, you know, we use the word rush, uh, so kind of going up and hanging out with the guys that you want to be a part of and showing an interest. And also they've demonstrated an ability to fly pretty well and predictably behind the ship themselves. So they're not struggling. They're relatively proficient at this. They are, or at least they, if they're new, they've shown, uh, they've shown the aptitude required commensurate with their experience, and they've shown the ability to get it uh, and continue improving. Because, you know, everybody starts off and everybody's young at one point. 
And so what we're looking for is that positive trend and a good attitude and an ability to be humble as an instructor, because uh, as we'll talk about here soon, you're going to be doing a lot of debriefing and teaching soon. So we're looking for guys with great attitudes. We're looking for guys who are good team players. And we're looking for guys who can hold their own behind the ship. And if you can meet those three criteria, and there's also, if we're being honest, there's a bit of timing involved with it too, because each squadron is only allowed to have so many LSOs. But all those things being said, you start going up. And uh, I think the way that I've described it in the past is the first time you go up and stay on the LSO platform and, and you watch Jets land, I would compare that to being an umpire in baseball. And the first time you stand behind the home plate, Nolan Ryan or uh, Randy Johnson or some other hard-throwing pitcher is throwing. And you stand there and you're like, man, everything looks like a strike to me. (laughs) But after a while of watching enough pitches, you know, that was a little outside, that was a little high. And it's the same thing with watching airplanes land. You you watch enough of them and you start to see deviations and you start to see the corrections that the pilots are making. Uh, And really what I'm getting after here is that it's all OJT. It's all on to job training. Uh, because you can't really read a book and you can't really watch a, a YouTube video. You have to get out there and, and spend the time standing there and watching it. And sometimes that gets a little bit old, uh, but every, with every pass you watch, you're learning something. And so as a, as a squadron LSO, as a first tour JO, it's going to be a collateral duty for you. So within an air wing, we'll typically have four, sometimes five. We call them wave teams. Uh, and so what we do is we take all the LSOs from within the air wing, we divvy them up, and we make five teams out of them, or four teams. And each of those teams may have anywhere between four to six, maybe a few more LSOs, depending on how many guys are interested. And then it's a, it's a, it's a duty, just like you would stand uh, pretty much any other duty on the ship. So you may fly for three days, and then on your fourth day, you're off. But you're not off just kicking back playing Xbox. You're off standing back on the back of the flight deck, helping your buddies get aboard, learning, practicing, and, and, and doing a job, which is what being an LSO is. So then the next day comes, and there's a new team waving, and now you're back to flying again. And we call that duty like you go wave that day. And we also call you guys paddles. Can you give us a quick summary of why those terms exist? Yeah, we probably should have started there because that's pretty <laughs> important stuff. But if we go back to World War II, uh, what you'll see is that you had, you had some pretty uh, innovative uh, and, and pretty smart guys that figured out that uh, these pilots that were coming aboard these straight deck carriers needed a little bit of help to do it safely. And so uh, they got a couple of uh, pretty accomplished pilots. They stood on the back of the flight deck and they had... Um, I guess maybe think of it like big tennis rackets that were covered in real bright colors so the pilots could see them really well. And they would send, and through all sorts of different contortions of their body and moving their arms up and down and left and right, they could send visual signals to the pilots. Well, they called these things, I called them tennis rackets, but they, they were called paddles. And they were using these paddles to give signals to the pilots. So it kind of just became a, a, a colloquial term, if you will, where the guys that were doing the job were called paddles. And since they were out there frantically waving their arms around with these paddles in the air, the, the act of waving, I suppose, waving became a verb for what paddles the noun does. So these are only pilots. They're not the air crew members and non-pilots. So if I am with VFA-1 and a VFA-2 airplane is coming down, do I still wave that airplane if I'm the one on the pickle right now, which is just the, the different controls that we use for the lights and whatnot? Yeah, you do, uh, because the ultimate goal is to be able to get this new LSO, in our example, to be able to wave, like we just talked about, even though we don't use paddles anymore, we still use the verb, is to try to get that young pilot to be able to wave all the aircraft in the air wing. Now, air wings look uh, pretty homogenous these days, because almost everything's pointing, everything almost looks pretty similar to a Super Hornet. Uh, when I started my first air wing, we still had Tomcats, S3s, Prowlers, uh, E2s, CODs, and... Uh, it was important that you be able to wave all those aircraft because all those aircraft have very different characteristics, very different tendencies, very different failure modes, if you will. So when they have malfunctions, they're all very different because they're all designed differently. And the goal is to be able to understand how each of those aircraft perform behind the ship and what kind of an input you can give to that pilot to help him out and what kinds of things you can expect from that aircraft as the pilot's making those inputs. Okay, so each squadron will have a cadre of, what, three or four LSOs, depending. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And... So we can't have just all Indians running around. We need some chiefs. So each squadron belongs to the air wing. The air wing has its air wing commander and some staff. And on the air wing staff are two landing signal officers or paddles that have done that at some point. Now they come back, and they're kind of the guys in charge, right? So they're the ones executing the training, uh, forming the teams. But they're also out there every time, right? So when you are a CAG paddles as you were, it wasn't so much a collateral duty. It was your primary duty. And then if you were lucky, when your buddy had it, you, 
on your day off, you could go fly with one of the squadrons. Does that sound about right? That is right. And uh, just to kind of back up real quick, as that young LSO is training up, there's various qualifications that he earns that allow him to continue working toward that job that you just described of the, the CAG paddles, the CAG LSO. The first one that that young LSO will get, we call it a field qual, and that means that he's capable of, of waving his type aircraft and conducting field carrier landing practices at the, at the, at the field. Which is pretty benign. It's largely an administrative qual. He's able to deliver briefs. She's able to get herself back and forth to the LSO shack and not get lost. It's an entry level, and it says, okay, hey, you're tracking. The next qual they would get, and this would require some time underway, is called our squadron qual. The next one after that would be your wing qual. Now, the wing qual is, uh, is the goal that almost all LSOs are working toward during their first deployment. If they're able to get that wing qual, which means they're able to wave all the aircraft within the air wing in all weather conditions, day and night, to include malfunctions, if they get that wing qual, it's a milestone. It's a career milestone for that LSO. And what it does, it opens a door for them to then go to the FRS and teach new students. Because without that wing qual, they can't go and do that teaching at the FRS. Once they're at the FRS and they're teaching students, that's when they become eligible to, uh, to try to seek that CAG paddles job. Because they want you to have that experience of having seen some pretty colorful stuff from students uh, and then carry that experience forward out to the air wing. Because at that point, the buck stops here. I mean, for, as far as LSOs go, it's not like other positions where the higher rank, the better. I mean, you really stop as kind of a mid-grade lieutenant commander, 04, you've been in the Navy for about 10 years kind of thing. And beyond that, I mean, there are no air wing commanders or even squadron commanders that wave, except maybe on old timers day, right? Yeah, it's true. And one of the interesting things about that CAC battles job is, uh, you're right, you typically uh, when a guy gets first gets to his CAC battles job, he's a lieutenant, he's an 03. Uh, he may have selected for 04, but he's, he's still relatively young and inex- young and inexperienced in the in this broader Navy. Sure. But what's really interesting about that position is that young that young officer has tremendous access, reach, and influence on the aircraft carrier. You speak to the air boss a lot. You speak to the captain a lot because you are out there working the captain's flight deck. You're out there recovering aircraft aboard his landing area. Sure. You talk to CAG, the air wing commander, a lot. And sometimes, uh, sometimes as a as a junior lieutenant or a you know junior O four, you feel like you're talking to those people too much, because most of us try to avoid those senior ranking people. <laughs> but in that position, you're right because the buck stops with you as far as waving aircraft aboard the ship. You have a lot of influence. Uh, I don't want to call it power, but you have a lot of influence and you have a lot of authority for a relatively junior officer, sure. and uh, it should be wielded wisely. For sure. Talk to us very briefly, if you would, about when you get to the LSO platform, what equipment we have out there. What we have out there primarily is we have a couple, we have two, uh, we call them, well, there's all sorts of different acronyms that we'll try to avoid. But generally speaking, we have a couple of screens that are uh, tied to the cameras that are recessed in the flight deck looking aft. So we can see the aircraft as they're approaching the ship. We call this a plat. The biggest thing that we are using is uh, radios. Not the biggest thing, but one of the other things we're using is we're using radios. And they look like old telephones, and they're really kind of clumsy looking and really antiquated, but they work. They're effective. They are very (laughs) effective. And uh, so what we're doing is um, we got a couple of positions on the LSO platform. We've got one guy who's standing closest to the landing area. He's the controlling LSO, and he's not looking at anything except for the aircraft. Uh, and he's got that phone up to his ear. The next guy, uh, as we work our way outboard from the landing area, is the backup LSO. Uh, and typically that person will be more senior to the controlling LSO because now he's not only just looking at the aircraft, but he's also cross-referencing the plat so he can check lineup. Because we don't use those screens to judge glide slope for aircraft. Those are strictly to be used for lineup. We're using our eyeball and our, our very highly tuned and calibrated eyeball uh, to judge glide slope. And then Outboard from the backup LSO is where the CAG paddle stands. And then what you normally have there is you'll have one of those enlisted teammates that we talked about with the binoculars who's helping you out and making sure that the correct settings are set. Now, on those displays, you've got the ship's heading. You've got the a readout of what the wind is. You've got to, if, the, if the deck is moving around a little bit because of the seas are moving, it'll show you that. And it gives you a lot of information. But at the end of the day, it's just like flying the airplane. you got to have a scan. You can't mm-hmm. just look at one thing. You need to keep your, your scan moving and look at a lot of different things. For sure. You have to keep your situational awareness up. Uh, It'll tell you if the ship's healing or turning and all kinds of different stuff, which is relevant in those few critical seconds when the ship, uh, rather the airplane, is uh, is coming aboard right at the last minute. And then you you have a little um, 
I don't know what you call it, but almost like a uh, escape uh, mechanism there if an aircraft is distressed. And you guys, I mean, you're literally feet from a landing aircraft. So if there's a last second emergency and it starts heading towards you guys, you have a little way to jump for safety, right, without actually going over the ship? No, you do. If everything goes well, you've got several feet. Uh, when things start to get okay. a little bit colorful is when, you, like you said, you got a few feet. Uh, and so outboard of the LSO platform, you've got it, it's a big rubber net uh, that goes down maybe about 10 feet. Uh, and it's there to use if you need to get out of the way of something quickly. I've never heard of anyone using one. There's been times where I probably should have. Really? But more <laughs> often than not, I would use it to take a nap between recoveries. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's say I wasn't an LSO, but let's say I was, and my roommate is coming down, and I decide that he and I are good buddies, and I'm going to tell him, hey, Joe, just you know, just bring it a little over here to the left. Oh, you know, you probably need to add a little power. Can I just say whatever I want on the radio in those few 17 seconds or so when uh, Joe is landing, or do we have some terminology that is specific? We have very standardized terminology. <laughs> uh, Why is that? Well, for a number of reasons, but to, to make it most simple, because our radios aren't always perfect, uh, and sometimes a radio is cut in and out. Sometimes somebody else might be making a radio call over that same frequency while you're trying to communicate to the pilot. And so if we have very, very purposeful and very standardized terminology, and oftentimes you don't need to hear the entire transmission, you can hear a part of it. And so, for example, if, if the pilot is uh, lined up a little bit left of center line and I need him to correct to the right, there's only one thing that I'm going to say, and it's, I'm going to say right for lineup. Take that to the other side of center line. If he's lined up to the right side of center line and I need him to get on, I need to make a correction to the left, I'm going to say, come left. It's unambiguous. If all he hears is part of that transmission, he knows what I meant. Uh, and so those are for, for, for lineup corrections. And you've got a number of calls as well that relate to glide slope. Some of the ones that maybe people who uh, watch videos on YouTube are most familiar with would be power, wave off, and different commands like that. All right. And some of this, unfortunately, has been learned through trial and error. Wasn't there a T2 uh, several years back that they said work it on speed, which was a bit non-standard, and it was interpreted incorrectly by the pilot, so he actually slowed down more? Yeah, more or less. You know, not to get too far into the details, but he had a, he had a failure with uh, his AOA indicator, uh, and the LSOs were seeing, uh, they were seeing that he was slow. And uh, instead of saying you're slow or instead of saying power, which is what the aircraft needed, they right. said work it on speed. But inside his cockpit, he didn't think that he was slow. So he's looking at a light indication for his angle of attack for AOA, but the LSOs are looking at the whole airplane. Okay. So the terminology is there because we trained it with it at the field in the simulator and from day one on our landings. And we know that when he says this, that we do this with the airplane and there's no question about it. Now, that being said, it's not a pure science. I mean, there's a little art to what you do, especially if I'm coming down and having a rough night, you can kind of sweet talk me a little bit, right? I mean, early in the past, you don't have to give me direction so much as you can tell me where I'm airing. Hey, you're lined up a little left. But when the chips are down and it's in the, it's in the short hairs, then you need to tell me. But you're also not going to talk to me every time, maybe just if I'm struggling or having a, a bad day. Is that true? That's true. And to your first point, you're absolutely right. There's different kinds of calls that fall into different categories. And Typically, the further out away from touchdown you are, we'll try to use advisory calls. So in the example that I was given earlier, if the guy is lined up right of center line, I might just say, you're lined up right, because I trust that I've given him information, he has time, and he knows what to do. He's going to fix it on his own. Now, if he continues coming in and getting closer and closer to touchdown, and he hasn't made that correction, now I'll shift from an advisory call to an imperative call. This requires an immediate response, so I would say, come left. And I can also use inflection. So I might say, come left, or a little come left. Uh, or if I make it a hard, you know, a hard come left, then he knows that to, to match his control inputs with the inflection that I used in my voice. So yeah, you're right. There's, there's advisory calls that are further out, and we'll try to use those uh, maybe just to get a guy to a good start or uh, prevent him from gooning away a good start. And then as you get closer in, those calls become less advisory, and they become more, okay, you got to do it now, man. Also, if we touch down... And we do not engage the wires, possibly from our own fault, or maybe it just skips the wires, the hooks sometimes do. Then we bolt her, and you may just give us a call for that. Just, again, we're going to know right away, generally, but it's just your way of also saying, hey, dude, sorry, you're going around again, and just make sure you, in fact, 
added power. Yeah, and that calls also not just for that pilot who bit, missed. Trust me, that, the pilot knows he missed because right. he's not stopped, and he's like, man, why am I in the air again? So he knows. But that calls also for other aircraft that are airborne. Uh, that call maybe helps build situational awareness for the tanker that's airborne. Uh, that call also mm-hmm. builds situational awareness for the air traffic controllers downstairs who maybe aren't watching the TV. They're just watching little sticks and stones move on a, on a display. Uh, so there's a lot of people who that call could help. Sure. It can also matter to the flight of two, going back now to our scenario, you and me, coming into the break. And if that guy bolters right in front of us, now we're screwed and we probably do have to jump into that spin pattern. Unless we got to the front of the ship before he did. And again, without getting into too much detail, but I think the listener can figure out there's a lot to this. So if he goes upwind and has to come around, then we all have to adjust off that. All right. So anything else on LSOs? Are we... No, I think we covered a lot of the basics. Okay. Um, I think as you know, as we talk about CAC paddles, there's a lot of responsibilities other than just waving aircraft. Uh, oftentimes you have a collateral duty as the air wing safety officer, uh, or maybe you work with the flight hour program, divvying up you know, which squadrons in the air wings get how many flight hours each month. So there's other things that you're doing. We also like to always kind of joke amongst ourselves, and I think there's some truth to it, that we're also the air wing morale officers. Uh, and so sometimes, uh, and I don't know if you've mentioned it, but there's a, we'll do folks will follies and it's kind of a get together where we recognize some of our top performers. We make fun of each other. Uh, and it's almost always in good spirit and, uh, and, and fun. Uh, we're, we, we make sure that that goes off. Well, we make sure that the pilots are happy. Uh, we do our best to make sure the pilots are happy mm-hmm. because, uh, something that I was taught by a mentor of mine is that a happy air wing flies better. And, uh, if we can do what we can do from our, from our positions, to keep morale up within the air wing, then I think that goes a long way to making sure that we get the best out of those pilots behind the ship. For sure. Yeah, that, I mean, those guys, every air wing I was ever in, the CAG paddles were kind of the goofy guys that you love to see in port, you know, and buy them a beer or whatever and, and have a good time. But you also trusted them with your life and you knew that they were there for it. And you always, at least I did, enjoyed hearing their voices if you had to hear a voice on the radio because you knew it was them and it, they'd bring you home. So, all right, so let's go back to our scenario. So you're at 180 uh, you're at the 180, I should say. You're at 600 feet. Your gear and flaps are down. You're slowing to on speed. And now you're going to make that procedure turn. And I don't think it's necessary farther that we tell them the rate of descent, the angle of bank, and all that. Uh, but we get ourselves around so that we've just crossed the wake. And we're at the what we you would call the start. And it is at that point then we're going to start flying down and, and getting ourselves aboard. So talk to us about... Gosh, I mean, the whole thing. I mean, you, you're, you're, what you're doing with the airplane and what the LSOs are seeing and what we call the different portions of this procedure uh, all the way to touchdown there. Yeah, so to kind of back up real quick to the 180, like you mentioned, one of the real important things that we need to pay attention to when we're coming in for the break uh, is how much G we apply and how fast we're coming in because we want to be a, a very predictable and set distance away from the ship laterally. So well, let's just say at 1.5. So we want to be a mile and a half uh, a beam from the ship. Now that can increase or decrease depending on the, the weight of the aircraft because the weight of the aircraft will determine how fast it's flying, which translates to how big of a circle you're scribing and, and so on and so forth. But we want to make sure we're paying real close attention to how far a beam from the ship we are because that will help make sure that we roll out on center line later on when we're finished with this turn. So muscle memory is a big part of this, right? If I get to the same spot every time that I have in hundreds of practices, then I can do the same thing I've done every time, and I should get to a good start. Yeah, we just hope that same spot you're getting to is the right one. Right, yeah. Well, in my case, it usually wasn't, but anyway. But uh, so th- that 180-degree turn that you mentioned, that's almost entirely an instrument turn. And, uh, and for HUD-equipped aircraft, that just means you're looking at the instruments that are in the HUD in front of you. Uh, you're managing your angle of bank, your rate of descent, your airspeed, uh, and it's an instrument turn. Uh, somewhere around halfway through that turn, we'll we'll teach guys, hey, that's a good point to take your first look out at the ship. And after you've done it enough times, like you've you mentioned, you, you get a sight picture, you get a familiar, okay, hey, this feels right, this looks right, uh, and you're back flying your instruments for maybe another 45 degrees a turn. Uh, and as you're crossing the wake, like you mentioned, if there is a wake, you start to be able to see the meatball. And we'll, we'll describe what that looks like here, here in a few minutes. But you start to see that, and you start to slowly transition your scan from the instrument scan in the HUD to more of an outside scan as you... Uh, manage the aircraft's energy, its angle of bank, to roll out on center line, hopefully on glide slope, uh, with the aircraft under control. We don't want to come sliding through there looking like a whirling dervish and just, you know, transit through center, center line and transit through glide slope. We want to arrive in a stable position so that we can then uh, make that outside scan to the, the meatball using the meatball lineup angle of attack, which we've been taught since day one, and fly the glide slope all the way down. 
Okay, so when I finish that 100, it's actually, I guess, what, 190 degree turn, theoretically, right? So when I finish that turn, what you're saying is I should arrive at a point in space and time, really, that is perfect in all possible ways. In other words, I'm at the right altitude. I'm at the right lateral position. I'm not sure what else to call that, but on center line. I am at the right angle of attack, which is simply the difference between my flight path and where my nose is. I'm at the right speed, and I'm in the right configuration, which was done earlier, and I'm on the right power. Because if I came into this really wrapped up, I need more power on the aircraft. So as I roll wings level, if I don't adjust my power, I'll be overpowered and either not have the right rate of descent. That was the one I was missing, is rate of descent. So everything has got to be right on here in order to get to that spot so that hopefully you're now just making fine-tuned corrections all the way down. And at this point, you went from looking inside almost exclusively for the first 90 degrees to now you are taking a quick glance at things inside, but for the most part, you're looking outside. Now, you talked about the meatball. Let's talk about the lens real quick. What, what are we looking at to gauge our glide slope relative to the path we want to follow to get to where we want to land? Yeah, so I'm going to try my best to, to describe this, and I, I th- I think I can do it. Right. Um, so draw a horizontal line in your mind, and those that horizontal line is green. That is the, we call it the datums, and that is our horizontal reference. And that those, those green lights are always lit. They don't move. They don't change. That is our horizontal reference line. About halfway down that green line, there's going to be a row of vertical lights. And those lights are all tilted at a, at a very specific angle. And the way that those are designed to work is that you should only see one of those light bulbs at a time, depending on where you are in space. So you see all the green, but only one yellow, and the yellow will be relative to where you are on the glide slope. Correct. So if, you are, if you're high above glide slope, you'll see the, a yellow light that is noticeably above the green horizontal line. Okay. If you're low, you'll see a yellow light that is well below that green horizontal line. If you get low enough, the bottom two are red, and those are meant to really get your attention. And uh, you don't want to see those. I've seen red. Yeah, <laughs> we, we all have, but we strive not to. And so each of those uh, vertical lights, it's called the source. And you, should only see, you will only see one of those at a time, depending on where you are in space. Those lights are focused to infinity. So really, your eyeball is the limiting factor for how far out you can see those. But if we do a little bit of geometry, the further out we get from that, because they're all oriented at a bit of a, um, kind of think of a, a, a fan of light. The further out you get from the source of that fan, the taller each of those cells get. So as we get very, very, very close to touchdown, the wedge of light that each of those cells is casting is pretty narrow, maybe just a couple feet. But if we go out to a mile, that same wedge of light that's only maybe a foot or two at touchdown might be 25 or 30 feet. Uh, And so it really depends on how far away from that lens you are, how accurate of information you're getting from it. And that's why if we back up a second, the further out we are, we tend to fly our instruments until we get closer in, and then we can get more reliable information from the meatball. So back to our, uh, our case one, our daytime turn, as we're coming through those last 45 degrees of turn, we should see the yellow ball. Uh, and for a whole number of reasons that are beyond the scope of this, it should, be, it should be above the datums. It should be above the green. As we roll into the start, like you mentioned, we want to have our energy. And there's a, there's a lot of components that make up our energy. Uh, it's it's our, where our left hand is. How much energy are we putting into the engines or asking for from the engines? Are we at the proper AOA? What's our angle of bank? Because that's going to determine the vertical and horizontal components of our lift vector. There's a lot of science here, but really what it comes down to is getting the aircraft in the right piece of sky with the right energy on it so that you can then transition into flying the meatball all the way to touchdown. So am I just looking at the meatball the rest of the time now? So what we talk about it for our scan, and this goes back to our very first days of, of learning how to fly jets, is we talk meatball lineup angle of attack. So our scan is meatball like we just talked about, line up. So we're looking to make sure that we're, we're scanning to make sure that we're going to land on the, on the center line. And that can be really tricky, not just with crosswinds, but also, like we talked about, the ship is pointed one direction and your runway is pointed 10 degrees off of that. And so as long as the ship is moving forward, your landing center line is moving to the right. And so nominally, you're going to have to continue to make a bunch of little corrections back to the right as your center line moves away from you. And then angle of attack. That's the energy on the aircraft, the speed. Or is, is the aircraft at the right attitude? Uh, and that's important for a number of reasons, not least of which is if the aircraft is at the right attitude, and very basically uh, we talk about the nose going up and down. Is the nose up too high? Is the nose down too low? 
If the nose is up too high, you're probably slow, which means you're running out of energy and the aircraft is approaching stall. If the nose is too far down, you're fast, which means that the aircraft is coming in too fast and that now you start having issues with the energy imparted on the resting wire. If you're slow and the nose is cocked up too high, think about the tail hook on the aircraft is like a pendulum. Now it's at the bottom of it, and that means you're putting it closer to the back of the ship and it's going to hit something it shouldn't. If you're fast, then the tail hook is raised up, and so now you have the chance of missing the wires. Also, if your nose is cocked up too high, you think about us, we're sitting in the cockpit, what's that do to our perspective of the lens? It changes it. So we might be seeing a different light cell that we talked about than where the aircraft actually is. And that might lead us into making uh, incorrect corrections. Plus the landing gear itself is built to land at a certain attitude, I believe. So if you're too far one way or the other, you could damage the aircraft. You can, and uh, especially with our Hornets, it was a lot more common that we would, uh, we would, we could bang them up bad enough that we'd have to take them downstairs and do some inspections on them. All right. So meatball lineup angle of attack, like you said, even if you're perfect, you're always going to be making some slight corrections to the right, just based on the geometry here. And then the angle of attack. Now, if you trim the aircraft up, for the most part, it's going to stay in that attitude. But as we now arrive at the start, as you LSOs will call it, and we get closer to the ship, we have some wind that changes a little bit. And so you're constantly making corrections the entire way down. I mean, you're not just setting it once and forgetting it, right? I mean, it's, what, dozens of minute corrections every second, it feels like. It is. And, you know, to the point about angle of attack, yeah, we do trim the aircraft, and uh, each aircraft has its specific trim setting. And for the most part, if you see an aircraft that's in the groove, you know, on final, and its AOA is changing a lot, it's usually because the pilot's hand-fisting that jet. Uh, and I'm guilty of that uh, myself. What will happen with um, the winds that you were referencing? So we talked about natural winds earlier and, and ship-made winds. All that wind's blowing across the flight deck, and there's a lot of stuff on the flight deck. There's lots of airplanes. There's lots of equipment. And not least of which is a really big tower, which stands uh, pretty, pretty yeah, prominently. The island. The island, yeah. Right. It stands pretty prominently on top of that flight deck. So as the wind is coming across the flight deck, it's getting disturbed. It's getting uh, jumbled up, if you will. And then it travels aft. It goes off the back end of the ship, and it... And it for lack of a better phrase, it falls down to the ocean, it travels aft some more, and then it will rise up, and it will kind of, uh, it'll, the wind will kind of rise up. So now let's reverse our perspective, and we're an aircraft coming into land. Well, the first part of that effect, the burble that we're going to feel, is we're going to feel a little bit like somebody just reached up from underneath the aircraft and just kind of pushed it up a little bit. A little bit of an updraft. It is. It feels like an updraft. And, uh, and our tendency is to, we'll see that on the lens, we'll see, our, we'll see a ball start to rise up. Uh, and our tendency will then be to pull a little bit of power uh, so, so we arrest that, that, that climb and, and don't go too high. That lasts uh, not very long, uh, and the more experience you get, the, the better you get at handling it. But what you don't want to do there is you don't want to pull a whole lot of power off because what's going to happen in a few seconds is you're going to get to that part of the that line of wind that we talked about, and it's going to be where it's going off the back of the ship and going down. And that's where we'll talk about the, uh, the burble a little bit more in the negative sense. And the fact that it, as you're flying through that disturbed air, it's going to feel like somebody is reaching up from the bottom of your aircraft, grabbing the landing gear and trying to pull you down. <laughs> and uh, depending on how strong that is, uh, will determine how much power it takes out of you and the aircraft to power through it and stay on glide slope. Especially if you overcorrected the lifty part of it a moment ago, you might have pulled a bunch of power off. And now not only have you lost the lifties, but you're in a little bit of a sink. And so you're coming down, and the danger here is now we're getting close to the back of this big metal ship. That's right. And for, for some of the listeners that maybe fly uh, general air or fly commercially, and we talk a lot about microbursts and what those indications look like in a cockpit as you enter it, you know, you feel like you're getting a little bit high, fast, and overpowered. And what you don't want to then do is pull a whole bunch of power, because as you go out of the back side of that microburst and you have a tailwind, you can find yourself underpowered very quickly. So it's not the exact same when we talk about the burble, but it's pretty similar. All right. So... At that point, you are doing meatball lineup, angle of attack, all the way down. And at some point, you are aware that you're starting to come over the back of the ship. And at this point, correct me if I'm wrong, you can almost transition solely to the ball at that point. I mean, you can take a quick glance to the right to uh, check your lineup one more time, but there's not a whole lot you can do in those last few seconds. Meanwhile, Paddles is watching me. And if I'm doing a decent job, they should not have to say anything. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, that's what we hope for. Uh, and specifically when we take students to the ship, one of the checks that we're taking to make sure that we can send them to the fleet is, can they get aboard if their radios failed? So uh, let's say their radios failed and we could not communicate with them. Are they able to get themselves aboard the ship safely without any calls from the paddles? And if they can meet that standard, then uh, usually we'll, we'll, we'll stamp them good to go. Excellent. All right. And so that glide slope you were talking about before, what's the equivalent glide slope for that as far as degrees go? We're going to be targeting three and a half degree glide slope. 
uh, and what that's going to yield because of the winds and the closure rates and a lot of science that I'm not smart enough to understand is it's going to give you an effective 2.8 degree glide slope. Okay. Which for civilian is usually about three degrees. So yes. it's fairly close to that. And then so... We're in this situation, we're flying down, and all of a sudden, bam, we slam down with about, what, 750 feet per minute rate of descent, a couple Gs of spike on the gear there, which is why Navy and Marine Corps aircraft landing gear is usually pretty beefy. And instinctively, we go to full power for the reasons we talked about before. And if everything has worked out right, on a four-wire ship, we should have hit the three-wire. Now, why is that? The wires are numbered from aft to forward. So where is the glide slope leading me? In this case, let's say we're targeting uh, between the two and the three wire. Um, and we can move the target point too, depending on how many wires are available, uh, what the weather conditions are, all, all sorts of number of things that we can, we can change that. But nominally, let's say we're targeting between the two and the three wire. Because that's halfway. It is. Right? And so that's going to put the, and when we say targeting, what we're targeting is we're targeting the hook touchdown point. So there's only really one part of that aircraft we're concerned about, and that's the tail hook, putting the tail hook in the, on the right piece of flight deck to engage the, the, the arresting wire. So we back up to that three and a half degree glide slope, which has given us about effective three degrees. What that's going to give us, all things being equal, on center line, on glide slope, and on speed, on a four wire ship, our hook should cross the back of the ship with about 14 feet of separation. So yeah, to your point, we're targeting the three wire, our hook should touch down in front of the three wire, we catch it, full power, we stop. So if I'm a little low, I might catch the two. If I'm a little high, I might catch the four or bolter. Mm -hmm. If I'm really low, I might catch the one. Or if I'm too low, you'll just send me around. Now... After I land and shut down, generally the LSOs as a team will come around and debrief me. Now, we have nomenclature for the pass. So talk about that and then tell me why we have grades, if you would. And you can do that in the opposite order if you want. Yeah, so I think we'll start with the, like you said, backward. You ask any number of pilots, you're going to get any number of opinions and answers of why we have grades. I think the ones that, uh, that I subscribe to most is that it draws out the best uh, every time. If every time you go out there and you know you're getting graded, we're all competitive people. And we all want to get an A. Uh, anytime we show up and we take a test or we do something, we want to we want to know we did it well. And so I think by grading the passes, it forces, or at least it ought to bring out the best in each person if you know you're being graded. And that's important when we're doing something that can be as dangerous as landing aboard ship. Because the byproduct of doing your best will be that it'll be a safer pass. It should be. So how do we grade these passes? Well, the best analogy is A, B, C, D, and then then an F. The best that you can get is an OK underline. And that's that's like a unicorn, right? It is a unit, it, you know, and you may get that on your last your last trap in the Navy, or if you brought aboard a jet that was banged up and it was really really hard. So it's, it's pretty rare, but you know, all things being equal, your A, that's an okay. So we tend to understate things. So, you know, some people might hear okay, well, it doesn't sound very flattering. Well, an okay is what you're striving for. Uh, and that means that it was a good pass. Um, there were some deviations, but they weren't big and you handled them correctly. A B, we call it a fair pass. Uh, and there were some deviations. They were probably a little bit more than what we would have seen out of an okay pass. You handle them well, but we'd like you to do a little Safely better. Safely enough. Yeah. And then we start getting into the ones that we don't let listeners like to get so much, like a no grade. So they were below average deviations. Your corrections maybe weren't necessarily the best or they weren't timely. And we don't really want to see that pass again. And that's that's where we start looking at our C's, our C minuses, our D's in that, in that comparison. You know, there's some, the wave off. Uh, so if you come around and you just got, you got everything out to lunch and you're not safe to come across the ramp, we need to make you go around, try it again. We're going to wave you off. We're going to hit a button. It's going to make all the red lights flash, and your grade will be wave off. Uh, we don't want those. Um, you can get graded for a bolter. So if you come down and through poor technique or just bad luck, you miss the wires, uh, your grade would be a bolter. And that's like, a, what, a 2.5-ish? It is. Or you can, uh, on a real bad day, you could get a no-grade bolter. Ooh, okay. So not only did you not stop, but you also uh, got a bad grade for not stopping. Because we also monitor boarding rate. So if I come down 10 times and I boltered one of those times, and I only have a 90% boarding rate. That's correct. And uh, what we're striving for typically as an air wing with all of our pilots is we're, we're striving for something north of 90. So, uh, you know, a good proficient air wing can, you know, usually be hitting between 94, 95% boarding rate. Okay. So we get these grades, and we, over weeks at a time, will have a string of landings, and they'll either be okay or fair or whatever. And then you talked earlier about folks will fall. So... Talk to us about the line period and then the little celebration that we do there. Yeah, so a line period, I don't think it has a defined length, but it's just some period of time underway, usually between port calls. It could be six weeks, it could be eight weeks, something in that ballpark. And what we'll do is uh, we'll, take, we'll take the average, kind of like we talked about, a GPA. 
So the way that you would look at your, your report card, if you will, for that line period is, uh, hey, I had a 3.75 GPA, which means I had more OKs than fares, and I had a, a 97% boarding rate, pretty strong. And, you know, I think most guys will be pretty happy with that, but that's not going to get you in the top 10 uh, in most air wings these days. Um, and, and what we do is we recognize the top 10 ball flyers in the air wing, and I think that helps to kind of build that competition, which we talked about earlier, brings out the best, or at least should be pushing people to give their best. So what we'll do at the end of that line period is we'll all meet in the forecastle, which is a, a room up at the, a, a big space up at the front of the ship, uh, and we'll we'll recognize those, those best pilots in the air wing. We'll put on some skits. There might be some songs. Uh, some silliness. Some of the more savvy uh, JOs, can, uh, they can make some pretty good videos. Uh, and really, it's just a, it's a, a real irreverent time to make fun of each other in a good spirit, to have fun at uh, some senior officer's expense. Uh, and <laughs> well, to the ju- air wing usually picks on the ship guys. Yeah, for sure, especially yeah. the air boss oh, and, yeah. uh, you know. Sometimes the captain or the admiral. But it's time for the air wing to come together, recognize the strong performances. Also, if you've met a milestone, Stone. So let's say you've got 100 traps on this particular ship. Uh, we'll recognize that. And, uh, you know, sometimes you see some pretty impressive ones. You'll see some of the more experienced guys getting four or five, uh, 600 traps on one ship. That's pretty wow. rare to get them all in one. Yeah. Um, but we like to recognize those strong performers and do it in front of our peers. And so they can take these patches, put them on their jackets, and it's just a, another badge of honor to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm good at this. And, and again, I think the idea is we're incentivizing behavior that is prudent to safety. Yeah, I think it's not too dissimilar from raising kids. Uh, you, you reward them when they do things well, and uh, when they do things poorly, you let them know that that's, uh, you don't want to see that again. Yeah. So I will confess, uh, Farva, I one time touched down, and I don't know what was going through my pea brain. I was pretty young. And I guess I must have thought that I'd always been going accidentally into afterburner at touchdown instead of full power, which for the listener doesn't matter a flip. It's just a little louder. You burn a little bit more of your gas, which who cares? You're about to shut down. And for whatever reason, I said, all right, I'm not going to go an afterburner. I'm going to hold my throttles here or even pull them back a little bit. And I had about four different voices yelling at me, power in the wires. Even though I was coming to a stop, I did not raise the power. So can you guess what kind of pass I was graded on that one? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, you probably got the worst pass, which is uh, we call it a cut pass. I did indeed. And, and I uh, even got a trip up to see the air boss. So a cut pass is what? Cut pass is uh, you were dangerous, you were unsafe, and we can't let that happen again. Without a serious talking to. And uh, I think what you'll find, uh, and, and, and you know, grateful that uh, your experience was different, but most guys don't get, uh, you may get one or two of those in a career. I think that was my one and only. I don't remember a second, but I remember that because it stuck with me. Yeah. And because paddles had a good talking with me. The boss had a good talking with me. The squadron CO had a good talking with me. Everybody's like, Jello, what the heck? And it was some lame excuse. I don't know. I thought I was going into burner too much. So it gets your attention real quick when you get a cut pass. Yeah, and if it's debriefed effectively, like it sounds like yours was, and there's training. Uh, I mean, it's one thing just to go yell at a guy. I mean, chances are you, you felt bad enough. You didn't need anybody yelling at you. But if it's debriefed effectively, there's a lot of good training that can come out of it, and it sounds like that was the case with you. I would not say I was a naturally talented ball flyer. I will say, though, the happy ending is that I did break into the top 10 twice in my career in 705 <laughs> traps, which isn't a lot. I know some people have a whole sleeve full of them, but, hey, I'm blue collar, so I was just happy to not get any more cut passes, which I knew I wouldn't. But, you know, a fair and okay was fine by me. I knew I had to work extra hard at it. But, again, the grades incentivized that, and... Boy, it was a surprise. I had no idea. I wasn't tracking grades, but when they did call my name at one of those folks of follies, I was pleasantly surprised. So Yeah, you know, we used to always tell our, our nuggets, our, our brand new pilots, just focus on flying fair passes that stop. Yeah. Uh, and if you, if you focus on flying fair passes, it means you're doing the fundamentals well, and, and the okays, the grades will take care of themselves. But fly fair passes that stop. And if, if you can make that your foundation as a, as a professional uh, naval aviator around the ship, you're probably going to do pretty well. For sure. All right, Farber, we are just about out of time here. I do want to cover, though, quickly a couple more things. So in our scenario just now, it was a beautiful day, and it was what we call case one. If the weather is just complete dog squeeze, as we would call it, uh, then we have to go to case three. Now, we're going to talk about that on the next episode, but essentially I'll just answer my own question here. That's where we stack up differently, way behind the ship at about, what, 15 or 20 miles and more, single aircraft. But in the daytime, we can also do a case two, which is kind of a hybrid of the two. So can you just quickly touch on how that works? Yeah, so let's say there's a, let's say there's a, a pretty solid uh, undercast right around 1,000 feet. Well, we know that we can operate safely underneath that. 
uh, if the visibility is good enough. But we got have we have to get underneath it in a pretty safe and standardized way. So what we'll do uh, is we'll use an instrument approach, uh, attack and approach. And that will be the way that we get under that overcast so that we can get into the clear air to fly that normal daytime pattern. So we can have up to two aircraft in a formation. And whereas before we needed people to have the situation awareness to collapse the stack on their own, now in your scenario you might have a marine layer, let's say anyone who lives near the ocean is familiar, it's just that blanket of clouds at 1,000 or 1,200 feet, right at that perfect altitude, as you know probably from doing some CQ to drive you to case two. And we can all hang out in pairs back there, and then when they tell us when, we can push down at the appropriate speed and, and vectors, and we can arrive where we did in the case one scenario, except now the visibility may be poor. So there might be a little more calm, right, to ask, hey, is there anybody in front of me, or can I break now? Uh, but once you break, the rest of it's pretty much the same. Yeah, and, and just like we talked about the calls that the LSOs can give the pilots being very standardized, those calls you mentioned, those low visibility calls or low vis calls, mm -hmm. those are also very standardized, and they can help build people's situational awareness if the visibility or the weather gets uh, a, little, a little dicey. Excellent. All right, dude. Well, I still have a lot of stuff on my list here, but I think we can cover all of those in the next part on night landings. I really want to thank you for this. This is great. I'm sure there is something we probably didn't cover that someone wants to know, but there's always question and answer segments on the show. So who knows? Maybe I'll call you up or to see if I can wing it. But I do appreciate it. This has been, I hope, very interesting for our listeners. And anyone who listens to this show has probably been on YouTube already and checked it out. But we'll get a channel going as well and, and let them take a look. Before we let you go, a couple standard questions here. Uh, first off, what's the future hold? So you said you're back at the RAG, as you called it, the training squadron, but you're not a newbie. No, I was, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, to get selected for command. Uh, so the way that works for us is uh, I needed to go back and, and get uh, refreshed, recurrent, requalified, if you will, in the aircraft. Uh, so I, there's, a, there's a standardized syllabus at the training squadron. I go back and I, I execute that. There's some other academic, uh, some leadership schools and all sorts of stuff like that that we go to. And that takes, you know, several months to work your way through that. Uh, ultimately, uh, here in a, in a few months, I'll be showing up to my fleet squadron as the executive officer. I'll be working for a great guy, a friend of mine. He'll be the skipper. Uh, we'll go through, uh, you know, 15 months or so in, in that uh, with him as the CO and, and me as the XO. And then, uh, knock on wood, everything goes well. About 15 months later, uh, I'll have the privilege uh, to take command of that squadron uh, and lead them for the next 15 months. Outstanding. And then, of course, if that goes well, that can lead you to all kinds of future opportunities. Well, we'll have to keep in touch with you and let the listener know how you're doing. So good luck on that. I hope you have a great tour. You'll be deploying again, and I know you've got a family who will miss you, but you know, we, uh, I hope I can represent the listener here. We thank you for your service and your dedication and your sacrifice going out. I, I guess maybe I've got a couple of years on you, but I can't imagine going out for six or eight months anymore. So God bless you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, stay safe out there for sure. All right. And then our final question, Farva, is how'd you come up with the call sign? Well, uh, Around 2003, uh, I was finishing up the, the training squadron the first time, getting ready to go to my first fleet squadron. They were deployed over to the Eastern Mediterranean in support of uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. And about that time, uh, the movie Super Troopers was out and was pretty popular uh, around the, the ready rooms on carriers. And uh, they must have watched it every night on their way home from that deployment. Uh, and they had decided that regardless of who the next new guy was, his call sign was going to be Farva. Because in that movie, Farva's not... Uh, shall we say, the most popular, uh, <laughs> handsome, wise, uh, or just, uh, you know. So you were doomed from the start. You had, it didn't matter what you looked like or what your behavior was. Well, then I showed up and they got a look at me and uh, they were like, well, this just fits too well. <laughs> um, I, you know, carrying, carrying a few extra pounds in the middle and a bad haircut and apparently I looked just like them. So uh, it stuck. And, um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of dumb things since then, but apparently none of them dumb enough to change it. <laughs> Did you see they're coming out with the Super Trooper 2? Oh, I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> and Farva's in it, so you got new opportunity to shine. All right, Farva, well, unless you can think of anything else on day landings or arresting gear equipment, I think we have covered everything there is. So unless you got any parting shots, I think we can wrap this up and get out of here. No, thanks for having me, Jello. You're quite welcome, dude. Well, uh, good luck out there, and we'll see you. See ya. All right, well, that was a really awesome discussion. Once again, my thanks to Farva. Is he a great guy or what? I know there's a lot more we probably could have covered, a lot of nuances and subtleties of all the different, you know, equipment, the paddles, the way we fly the ball. We could probably go on for hours and hours, but we're going to leave it at that. And yes, I really did get a cut pass, and I'm ashamed to admit it, frankly, but 
one nice thing about this podcast is it's kind of a way for me to gain closure on things and share my embarrassments with everyone. <laughs> Not sure why that's therapeutic, but it seems to be. And like I said, I came back from that. So I think anyone who has a setback in just about anything they're trying to do, it's not the end of the world for them. You know, with the right training, the right coaching and mentoring, they can bounce back like I did and still have a successful career, or whatever it is they're trying to do. So keep that in mind if you're in a leadership position and you've got some young person who just needs some experience and mentoring. So we are just about finished with this carrier series that I thought would be about three parts, but because the material has been so compelling and taking a little longer than expected, we'll end up being about five episodes. And we will wrap it up next time, episode 15, with night carrier landings. Just recorded that the other day. Should be a real riveting discussion. And the one takeaway that I can just give you a preview of now is dark. Dark is bad. And bad is no fun when you're trying to land. So... Come back for that one. Uh, night carrier landings are scary. There's a reason everyone shudders when they think about them, at least those of us who have done it. And you'll hear all about it on episode 15. And that'll wrap up again our mini series on aircraft carrier operations. All right. Well, if you live in the Washington, D.C. area or will be visiting there on June 2nd and 3rd of 2018, I recommend you go check out the Pax River Air Expo. It's the annual air show they hold at NAS Patuxent River, Maryland. It is, again, June 2nd and 3rd. It features the U.S. Navy Blue Angels, the Geico Sky Typers, a friend of mine from flight school is actually one of those pilots, and they got a shockwave jet truck and all kinds of other exciting events and activities and performers for the whole family. So go over there. Admission, parking, are both free. It's a great time out in the sun, hopefully, to check out a show and just get excited about what your taxpayer dollars are doing and what brave souls, men and women, are doing both commercially and in the military. So go check out the PAX Air Expo June 2nd, 3rd at NES Patuxent River, Maryland. All right, so that will do it for this episode of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to remind you that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of myself and my guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Thank you for listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. If you have a question for the show, you can send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or you can leave a message on our listener line at 877-MOCK-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. And you can also find us on all the usual social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Visit our Patreon page to gain access to exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content and help support the show in the process. Please like, follow, and share us with your network. And if you have a moment to leave us a rating and review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it. So, like I said earlier, we will see you back here in about 10 or 11 days to finish this carrier series on night landings. Until then, you take it easy. See ya. flyby sound just now? That was me buzzing episode three guest Vern Vernalis on his fishing boat off the coast of San Diego a couple years ago. It was awesome. <laughs>